Good morning. My name is Joe Vendramini, and I'm a Ford Specialist at the Ring Cattle Research and Education Center at ONA. And today, my presentation will be about warm season forage mixtures for pasture establishment. This is a topic that I have been working on my research and extension program for a little while, primarily because pasture renovation is one of the most costly management practices that we can have in beef cattle production here in the States. As we know, we have several forages that we can plant by vegetative material or seeds. And the whole process of replacing the existing vegetation through herbiciding, disking, um, plowing, and then preparing the seed bed and getting seed or vegetative plant material is very costly and also require a lot of knowledge because it's a process that has several steps that you need to follow in order to increase your chances to be successful. Um, I think the first question is, uh, it's a difficult decision about uh, to pull the trigger and really um, make that decision that you need to, to renovate your pasture. So we create a, a tool that we call pasture condition score that is something quite similar to what we use in cow-calf productions on body condition score of cows in order to predict what will be the pregnancy rates. But the pasture condition score is trying to uh, make like more objective and simple uh, to make that process uh, a little easier for you to make that decision if you will or will not renovate your pasture. So it's, it's pretty simple. We create like three scores, can go from three to one. And then three is a pasture that is fully covered with your forage of interest. So that is a good pasture that will respond well to management practices such as fertilization and, and herbicide. Number two is a pasture that is uh, doesn't have the same cover. It may be around 70% cover but we still be able to recover that pasture through better grazing, fertility, um, and herbiciding. So I think number two here is a pasture that is still have some chance to, to bring it back to life and be productive. When number one is the critical situation here, it's a pasture when you reach to that uh, uh, scale, it's because more than 50% of the pasture is covered by undesirable species. That means most of the times in that situation, uh, renovation will be the best approach and then will trigger uh, the, the management practice that we'll talk later in this webinar that is mixing those species for pasture establishment. So we have a few publications online at the EDIS uh, website and that talks about the pasture renovation. This is one of them. And we try to make it a little simple um, for, for us to follow those procedures. So we have this and we have also some specific information in each forage species publication. But this is one that talks about how would be the, the best way to establish a new pasture um, in Florida. Um, and once you decide that you need to renovate your pasture, and then you, you start talking about what are the problems that you can encounter during that process. One, uh, in addition to the, the cost that we just mentioned, is that area that you are planting may not be harvested or grazed for between three and 12 months. When you plant some forages that have this low establishment, you may be up to 12 months without producing anything in that land. What happens most of the time is when you have a herd and you have grazing animals, many times producers do not sell animals because it's, it's not in the culture. You know, you have a herd that you select and you like, so you just keep the herd and renovate the pasture. But what, what happens is uh, you start overgrazing the remaining areas of the pasture because the area that you are renovating, you cannot use it. So then you create a problem in the good areas that you have that are probably um, fair in cover and forage production. Now you are overgrazing those areas. So that problem of not using the pasture for six, 12 months may, may actually aggravate your situation of forage production because you may be mismanaging 
the remaining areas of the pasture. Um, there are some forages that we use here in Florida that they are known for this low establishment. So one of them, for example, is Bahia grass. That is the one that we use the most. Probably 85, 90% of the pastures in Florida are covered with uh, Bahia grass. And we know that Bahia grass have very slow establishment. One problem with Bahia grass that is a little different from the other forage, so we don't have herbicide recommendation for newly established pastures. You need to let it establish before you can spray herbicide, so and then makes a little challenge on the weed control. So the brachiaria grasses are uh, what we call mulatto or caiman, are also, is a different category of forage because those are forages that has uh, greater seed cost, but in addition, they are productive and they have extremely good nutritive value. So those forages were tested here in Florida and they were, um, although they were a little higher management, they proved themselves to be productive and have really good nutritive value. Uh, but one of the problems of the brachiaria is, is also that it takes a long time to establish and many producers just quit using mulatto or caiman because of this low establishment. And later, it's 85 that although here in South Florida, Bermuda grasses are not the most popular grass, but if you go um, in North Florida or even in the Southeastern US, TIF-285 is probably one of the most planted Bermuda grass cultivars. And TIF-25, when you compare with Jigs or Bermuda 2000, we know that TIF-25, it is a forage that has a slower establishment. So the, the objective of the, the information that I'll provide to you, and that's pretty much mixing these warm season annual forages with the perennial forage at time of establishment is to have this greater forage production during that year of establishment. So with that in mind, with that objective, we design few trials that I will uh, describe to you now uh, by trial and I will describe the four species and management that we use. The first one is a simple trial where we tested Bahia grass and on those uh, we mix also pearl millet. That is quite a popular uh, annual forage here for us in South Florida. The treatments were Bahia grass by itself, Bahia grass plus pearl millet with half of the seeding rate. That means 12.5 uh, pounds per acre, where the full seeding rate will be 25 pounds per acre. So three treatments, we plant those uh, plots in June at Ona in South Florida, and the forage was harvested every six weeks after we plant those, those plots. This is just the results of the um, uh, separated here by harvest. So each harvest was done every six weeks. And, and then here by treatment, there would be Bahia grass, half of the mixture and full mixture. As you can see, when you have Bahia grass by itself, after six weeks, you have pretty much no production. There is no cover, no production. When Bahia grass starts establishing is low, 12 weeks after planting, and then 18 weeks, we, you have some production there, but you still can see 400 pounds of dry matter to the acre, that's pretty much nothing. That means 18 months after production, you have pretty much no production. After seeding, you have pretty much no production. But when you mix a half with millet, look at what happened. How in the, after six weeks after planting, look, we have, have almost a thousand pounds of dry matter to the acre. So this is a pretty reasonable forage production for that short period. And then harvest two was quite similar. And then harvest three, what happened was pretty much the millet is gone because it's an annual, will die. And the remaining forage here was, was bahia grass. You can see that the trend and production on the half mixture and the full mixture is quite similar. When, whereas the production in the bahia grass was quite low. This is just a little illustration of the plots. This is about three weeks after planting. You can clearly see here the plots that were mixed with millet and the plots that were not. And this picture here is at the end of the growing season. So by the time that we finish 
harvest. So you see most of the plots, there were no difference between the plots. So they were uh, covered pretty similarly. Um, when we compare now, putting together all three harvests and doing the, the forage production during that eight, uh, 18 months, Bahia grass very low, as we saw, but the half mixture and the full mixture, it were, uh, although we have here a numerical advantage of half, that, there was no difference, a statistic difference between half and full. And that's a good indication that we should use the half uh, of the seeding rate, 12.5 uh, pounds to the acre, because you give you some cost advan advantage here. You uh, spend less money at the time of establishment because you're going to be using half of the seeding rate. And then the ground cover that I just showed you the picture, you're going to see here, so pastures that we plant Bahia grass by itself and half of the mixture were similar. They will have the same ground cover after the pasture is established. Whereas the, the full mixture, we still have a decrease in ground cover. So showing that that may be a little detrimental to the Bahia grass establishment. So again, another indication here that we probably should go with the half of the seeding rate in the millet, and you're going to have uh, much greater forage production in the first year, and you're going to have the same ground cover as if you plant Bahia grass by itself. We'll switch to the second trial now. That was also uh, conducted here at the Range Cattle Research Center at ONA, and this is with the Brachiaria grass, the one that I mentioned to you that has superior nutritive value. It's a little bit more uh, high maintenance grass, um, more bunch grass type. And in this trial, we mix the, the brachiaria with sun hemp and sorghum. And this is the forage sorghum, not the grain sorghum. And we use the same approach. We have half of the seeding rate or we use the full seeding rate. The seeding rates for those forages are listed here on the bottom. So we use the same approach that we used in the previous trial. This trial was planted a little earlier. It was planted in April. And again, the harvests occur every six weeks after we plant it. So in our preliminary results here, we can see we have four harvests during the year. And you can see here, when you have the brachiaria by itself, harvest one has minimal or almost none forage production here. But when you have the mixture half, look at the contribution of this mixture in the first harvest. We, are, we have almost 2,500 pounds of dry matter here. Very good forage production six weeks after planting. And there was a combination, the, the, yellow, the orange bar here is sorghum and the gray bar it's sun hemp. So at half of the seeding rate, you can see a very consistent and significant contribution of the sun hemp here and also the sorghum in this first harvest. When we move to the second, we can we start seeing the brachiaris coming up and the, the sun hemp pretty much doesn't regrow well after clipping. So sorghum is providing most of the forage production here. And when you go to three and four, the herbage production will be pretty much uh, the brachiaria grass. Similar trend here when we go with the full seeding rate, but we can see, I think we create some competition between species here. And then we didn't have as good forage production as we had with the half seeding rate when compared to the brachiaria by itself. This is the overall uh, herbage production during the year. You can see here the brachiaria by itself produce about 4,000 pounds of dry matter where the half mixture produce about 6,500 pounds of dry matter. So much greater forage production here that is, is really important in that year of establishment. We saw that the full mixture was in between those two. And again, we have the additional cost of providing the full seeding rate. That is demonstrating again that we should use half of the seeding rate in these mixtures other than using the full seeding rate. And we talk about the nutritive value of this brachiaria that's pretty good. So when we mix brachiaria, sorghum, and sun hemp, those are three forages that usually have really good nutritive value. So we didn't see any difference among treatments, but we saw that there was a variation in protein and digestibility throughout 
the, the harvest or the growing season that we did, like six, 12, and 18 weeks. However, although there was a variation, you can see most of the forage was with protein around 15% or more. So that is excellent nutritive value that will meet the requirements of most of the beef cattle that we can graze uh, here in South Florida. And digestibility followed the same trend, although we decreased digestibility over time. So the lowest digestibility later in the fall uh, season was about 57%. That is still an excellent digestibility for um, uh, considering that we are working with warm season forward. So really good protein and digestibility. You can see some variation through the, the season, but uh, there is there were no difference among species. So they were all really good in nutritive value. So this is a little illustration for you about what happened in this trial. In the uh, left uh, hand corner here, you can see the mixture of sun hemp and uh, sorghum at half rate and at uh, six weeks. And then you can see here after um, about 18, 22 weeks here, you can see that at the end of the season, we have pretty much just brachiaria, but it's a good stand. On the other hand, on the bottom, on the left-hand side here, you can see that you have, uh, when we plant the brachiaria by itself, after six weeks, you have a, a quite a poor stand with a lot of weeds. But when we get to the end of the growing season, we still have a pretty nice stand of brachiaria. So it took a while to establish and to produce and I think this mixture at the, at the planting time really helped us to bump up that production in the year of establishing. And the last trial that I will share with you today is, uh, it was done in Gainesville, Florida at the Citra unit with uh, collaboration with Dr. Solenberger. And we tried the establishment of TIFTA 85 um, and remember, uh, in experiment one and two, we talk about seeded cultivars or seeded species. We plant bahia grass by seed and brachiaria by seed. Now, TIF25, we planted with vegetative plant material, uh, about 1,200 pounds of vegetative plant material to the acre. And then we plant the TIF25 and seeded sun hemp or pearl millet at half of the seeding rate or at full seeding rate, same approach using the other trials. So then those are the seeding rates, the full seeding rates here on the bottom. And we plant those plots in July and we have the same approach. We harvest every six weeks. This is a, a illustration of the results of the production by harvest again. So this is TIF25 by itself. We show here first harvest very little production, whereas the second harvest, we have a pretty good production here, 1,500 pounds, and then it decreased in harvest three, because if you think about Gainesville, if you are north of here, it get colder sooner than here, and uh, by this time it was fall, so the, the TIF-85 will have a decrease for the production during those cooler months. On the mixture, half, First harvest, we have much more forage production than the TIF-25 by itself. And there was pretty much millet that came up. And then look at what happened in harvest two. That was later in the summer. It was just a massive production, My, primarily on the millet. The sun hemp had limited contribution in this case, but we, we have up to 3,700 pounds of dry matter in the second harvest. So that was, a excellent forage production about 12 weeks after planting. And then there was the decrease that we mentioned in the fall. Uh, millet was dying out here, but we still have a little contribution from the 85. Here. On the mixture full, the trend was similar to what happened to the mixture half, but you can see that the magnitude was much smaller. It produced much less forage, and we believe that is because of the the self uh, competition between the plants and the species, but we still produce more forage than when we plant TIF-25 by itself. So this is just an illustration of the plot. So this is TIF-25 millet sun hemp at the full seeding rate. And this is the 
1585 per millet uh, sun hemp at the half seeding rate. You can see that even here in the picture, this half seeding rate looks much better. And on the bottom here, it's just 1585 by itself. And you can see here that we have much less forward and also you have a pretty significant amount of weeds. And we report the weed presence in these trials, uh, in this trial because it was pretty significant and different between treatments. So we saw that on the T25 by itself, we have about 35% of the material that we harvest were weeds. Whereas on the mixtures, you got to 7% um, of the material that we harvest, it were not a millet, uh, sun hemp, or T35, it was actually some weed. But remember, in this trial here, we never apply any weed control. So not only we, with these mixtures, we increase the production, but we also save on weed control in this T85 establishment. So there was something positive that we saw in this trial. And when we see the mixture, the total forage production during that season, we saw that the half mixture and the full mixture didn't have any statistical difference. It were similar, approaching 6,000 pounds of dry matter to the acre. That is a quite consider considerable amount of forage for the year of establishment. Whereas the TIF-25, we, we had about 4,000 pounds. That is a, a, a lower amount, but this is still uh, harvesting something the year of establishment is something positive. And similarly to experiment two, this TIF-25 has very good nutritive value and the millet and the sun hemp uh, has also um, good nutritive value compared to most of the warm season perennial grasses. So we saw that you, the crude protein concentration here, now we saw that uh, when we have TIP25 by itself, we go a little, gra a little greater um, crude protein concentration in, in the forage. So when we put the sun hemp and the, the millet, we had actually a decrease in protein in the mixture. Um, half of the mixture was better than the full mixture, but also a little decrease. But still, the, the crude protein concentration went down from 13 to probably 12 or 11 and a half, so that's still a pretty good uh, crude protein concentration for warm season perennial. But the trend was the opposite for digestibility. So we, the TIF-25 had probably the lowest digestibility when we compare with the mixtures. The mixtures were in between 60 when the TIF-25 was around 55. So we increased the digestibility of the forage when we include those, those species in the mixture. And in the subsequent year, this trial was conducted in 2018. So in the 2019, we evaluate the ground cover of these forages early in the, we did two ground covers and I'm gonna report the first one that we have earlier in the season. And you can see here that the TIF-285 by itself has a much better ground cover than the mixtures. Mixture half was intermediate and mixture full was really uh, not a good ground cover after we finish the trial. So that is an indication that probably for TIF-25, maybe for because it's planted with vegetative material, maybe because it's more sensitive to competition, you can see that mixing those annuals in the TIF-25 establishment, uh, it hurt the stand or the cover that we had. So it may be a management practice that may not be really helpful. Although you produce more for it in the first year, you may hurt the establishment of the T25 and that may become a perennial problem for you in the future because that will, um, the consequences will be you're gonna have more weed control and you have less for the production throughout the productive time of this uh, hay field or pasture. So with some conclusions here, so mixing this warm season perennial grass and, and annual forages uh, consistently increase for the production during that first year. So that was our objective and we could prove that this management practice is really effective to, to accomplish that. In general, the, this forage that we add to the mixture will have greater or the same nutritive value as the perennial. So you're gonna produce something in that year of establishment that has very good nutritive value. 
For that reason, you may decide to have a plan to graze those or to feed that forage to animals with greater nutrient requirements, such as first calf heifers or just growing animals, because that probably will be too good for mature cows or animals with lower um, uh, nutrient requirements. And the effect of this warm season annual on the on the subsequent establishment of the perennial is variable according probably to the species that we are trying to plant as a perennial. But we, we have uh, one year data for the Tifton 85 trial and we're gonna repeat that this year and try to collect more information and see what will be actually the effect of the environment and climatic conditions in those uh, variables. So we're gonna repeat those trials uh, for a few years to make sure that it's uh, it's effect of the species and we're going to evaluate the effect of climatic conditions on those. But we know that although increased production, sometimes in some species it may hurt the establishment of the ford. And so in that, in that case, we need to rethink about if we need to do the mixtures or not. I would like to thank you, the Milk Chekhov Research and Education Committee, that were instrumental of funding some of that research. And also uh, NARO that is uh, in Japan, that is the USDA brand in Japan, that also was in, interested in these mixtures. And we have a visiting scientist here that did the work in the first year with the brachiarias. Um, I would like also to promote uh, my podcast. It's a monthly podcast. If you go, it's available on YouTube and Joe Watt podcast, and we talk about some current issues in Florida beef production. Um, and you can check it out at YouTube. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be glad to take any questions.